Hello? Okay, now you can hear me. Awesome. And I've even got the screen working, which if you've seen how Max have been doing this week, um, this is pretty awesome. So, I'm excited. Why did it just say my number was five? Silly emulators. Tricks are for kids. Alright, that looks good. Everything seems to be fitting on the screen nicely. Which is the first step. So, hey BrewCon, anybody here believe in bring your own device? Let's see our hands up. Bring your own device to the workplace. Well, I've got something to say about it. So here it goes. It goes something like this. Which is where you cue the music and I start dancing, but not today. Too hungover from last night. Alright, so we're going to talk about a little tool I wrote called the Smartphone Pen Testing Framework or the Smartphone Penetration Testing Framework or as long as it comes out to be something like SPF, you can call it whatever you want. I'm Georgia and I'm CEO of Gold Security LLC. It has this little disclaimer thing because I did this project with the DARPA Cyber Fast Track program. So the program's now over, at least my part of the program is over, so I could actually get rid of this slide, but it basically just says the DARPA approved for me to say all of these things. And speaking of DARPA, love the DARPA a lot, like lots and lots of hearts, because before I got the DARPA Cyber Fast Track grant, I was junior pin tester at some company, and you know, dead end career path if there ever was one, and now I'm the CEO and get to come talk to you people, and when I want to go to a conference, I look in the mirror and say, hey Georgia, can I go to the conference? And I'm like, well, okay, if you get all your work done, you can go, which is a lot nicer than having to ask your boss, for real, so. And I recently found out that not only has the DARPA Cyber Fast Track program been extended to the next August for proposals, but also you don't even have to be a U.S. citizen to propose one. So if you have an idea for a project that's novel and interesting and somehow related to, you know, that air quote cyber, then perhaps you should turn in a proposal and get them to give you money to do research. There's really nothing better than that than getting paid for something I would have done anyways. So, our problem with smartphone security. We bring our smartphones into the workplace and they start attaching to things. So, who has smartphones in their workplace? Who attaches their smartphone to the network in some way? A lot of people now, and we want to. You know, when I actually had a real job, I had my iPhone on the network and it would pull down my email. I worked from home, so if I wanted to go to the beach and pretend I was at work, as long as I was still answering emails, nobody was the wiser. So being able to put my smartphone in the workplace was really awesome. And they certainly weren't going to pay to buy iPhones for everyone, so they said use the device you've got. There's just one problem with this. Well, there's a myriad length of problems with this, but the main problem being, what don't we like when we have devices in the workplace? We don't like out-of-band communication channels. We like to be able to see all your traffic, spy on all our users, and see exactly what they're up to, because that's what we do. However, smartphones, that's pretty much impossible, because they connect to the cell tower. So they're connecting to our servers, so we can see what's going on there, they're pulling down our information, they're reading our emails, storing them there, and whatnot. But there's really no way to tell if absolutely everything that hits that device isn't going out the mobile modem. I, as a security researcher, cannot tell you what's going out through the mobile modem except on my particular device. I can't spy on you guys' devices unless I put up a nice cell tower here and convince you guys to join it. I, in the workplace, cannot say what's going on. So, out of band communication at its finest. It wouldn't be a phone otherwise. If I suddenly told all my users, you can't use the cell network anymore, you now have an iPad without cell service that you paid several hundred extra dollars for, you're going to come into my office and tar and feather me. As well you should. So let's think about all the things that smartphones are accessing in the workplace. When I worked at the company where I used to work and I had my smartphone on the network, it would pull down my emails, that was the main function. It would also VPN in. So I had my customer reports sitting there on my phone, my jailbroken iPhone even, so who knows about the security of that. 
Uh, I had all those reports there. They weren't encrypted. There's no requirement for that. So theoretically, anybody who's on my phone can see all the pen test reports for all of my clients. I'm sure my clients would love to hear about that. But that's the case for most companies. And then when I VPN in, I just become another node on the network. So if I have root on somebody's device and they're just another node on the internal network, well, forget like cracking the perimeter and all the hard stuff. MSO 867 for the win. I'm already back there. I've also seen them actually generate one time passwords. Companies will put a custom app on there to generate the one time passwords to get onto the VPN or log into the email or log into the website. <laughs> And well, again, if I have read on the phone, I can make it generate the password for me. So that's even worse than password one, two, three. This is a password I can see. So let's talk about some of these threats against our smartphones. The big one that everybody seems to talk about this year is those ever-present apps. And I love apps. When I wiped out my phone to test the USSD attack the other night, it was, I thought I was going to die because I didn't have Twitter anymore. What was I going to do? I can't survive without Twitter. So I had to re-download all my apps. That's the first thing you do when you get a phone. A lot of them even come with a lot of the apps already on there, depending on what build you have, which makes it even worse because then they have system privileges. But we all know about malicious apps. They can happen, they can happen on Android, they can happen on iPhone, they can happen on Blackberry too, but it's so hard to code for Blackberry, I don't think any malware writer would bother. So that's why there's no Blackberry malware. It doesn't have to do with it being particularly secure, it's just that their like, app coding practices are so terrible, it makes me want to hit myself over the head over and over and over again, which is why there's no payload in SPF for Blackberry, not because there can't be, because it may hurt my brain. So this happens on all platforms. A user downloads an app. How do you know this app is secure? You really don't. Even some of your apps from places like Facebook or Google, you don't always see the best development practices. So while they might not be inherently malicious, they may give you insecurities. Like for instance, Facebook used to allow you to uh, send SMSs from inside of Facebook the app as if you need to. If they don't need more, maybe they listen to me and other people saying this is really silly. But inherently, anybody can write an app. You don't have to go to good coding school to write an app. You can even go to bad coding school and write an app. There's no cert for we have to be this good at writing secure code in order to put something on any of the markets. So there you have it. I can do malicious things and I have and so have many other people and it doesn't take a rocket scientist. So if your employees will just go out and download any app, which we know they will, we've all done it, we should all go to uh, addiction counseling for apps, the, our society as a whole is addicted to our smartphones and our applications, if they will download all these malicious apps, or potentially malicious apps, especially since there's no way to really tell these are the good apps and these are the bad apps right off the bat, will they just download anything and if they have, what does that mean for your environment? Good luck finding out. There's also software bugs. We saw just this week some of the Samsung devices thought it would be a really cool feature if we could pull up special codes on our devices and automatically run them without any user input. Great feature! Except it allowed people to remotely wipe your phone via a client-side attack. We'll actually look at that. It's in SPF now. I put it in yesterday, so we'll actually see that work. So, these bugs happen. Writing secure software is hard. Writing secure apps is hard. Writing secure kernels is hard. I mean, we see it over and over again. Windows, Linux, Mac. Mac doesn't get viruses though, right? No. <laughs> so, that means iOS could never have any viruses either, right? If Charlie Miller did not, in fact, write a malicious app, that was all hype, right? That never actually happened. Okay, we all know it did happen. So yes, kernels have bugs. Android is just a forked Linux kernel. A lot of the same vulnerabilities that come out for regular Linux come out for Android as well. Same thing with Mac and iOS. And this Windows 8 deal, oh god, it would be great if it had MSO 867 in, in it. Wouldn't that be tragic? But it could happen. So our browsers have bugs too. We see some of the newest iOS jailbreaks when iOS 4.0 came out and they said no one will ever jailbreak this device. And then like two days later a 16 year old kid did. 
that was through the browser. Because they're like, you can't run unsigned code, ever. But then, you have to run unsigned code in your browser so you can render web pages. And if you can't render web pages, what's everybody going to do? They're going to go buy an Android, which is the last thing Apple wants. So software bugs happen, and we have to assume that de the devices in our enterprise have bugs. iOS 6 is already jailbroken, so all your iPhone devices are exploitable. Same thing with your Android. I can't think of a version, Jelly Bean's already rooted, they root them immediately. There's so many really smart people working on this, we have to assume that there's a way to exploit these devices. Not necessarily remotely, but via client side or, or tricking the user in some other way, we can potentially exploit every device in the environment that's a mobile device. So, you might say the same thing about the PCs as well, but we kind of overlook this about the mobile devices. And then there's our favorite bug ever, the one that will never ever be patched. No matter how much security you put in the workplace, if your users will respond to my phishing attack and give me their email password, then I can start seeing your data. In this story. If you have VPN passwords, then they'll do the same thing once again. And you know, you'd be like, oh, we do two factor. So I call up your people and say, I'm having trouble getting into your account. Can you show me what it says on your little token fob? And there we go. Users will continue to do this. I used to think no one would ever fall for a stupid phishing email attack, but then I started doing them at work. And I don't even do a really good job. I send out an email that says, hi, I'm the phishing tester. Please give me your credentials. <laughs> Dear God, what is wrong? So my idea is that no amount of user awareness training is ever going to work. I used to put it on all my slides. User awareness training will save the world from smartphone insecurity. That is not true. It will never happen. This will continue to happen forever. User awareness training does not work. So if, even if your users are the best kind ever, and they will never ever click on a link in an email from georgia at gmail.com, or I am a hacker at gmail.com, or your company HR at gmail.com, they will never answer my phone call and give me their credentials over the phone when I'm pretending to be their boss, who they of course have never met because he's in some other country. But I don't really sound like an old man, do I? But anyhow, if they, even if they won't do that, Switch over to smartphones. Start looking at SMSs. So we've done our user awareness training. We have our set set of rules. We cannot click on links in emails. This is an SMS. How can a text message hurt me? It's made of text. Text cannot hurt you. And then I open it in my browser, and then it's over. I could also just send them a link to an app and say, hey, this is really awesome, and it turns all your Angry Birds characters bright pink and everyone will download it, and I can just get them that way. So if I can convince your users to run things on my behalf, that makes it that much easier. And we're starting to see this in the wild. I'm not sure if you're seeing it here, but I may get more text message spam than most since I use my real numbers in demos, but I get messages that say, you've won a thousand dollar Target gift card. And I'm like, yes, I get new stuff. I love Target stuff. It's lots of nice electronics, but sadly, it's not really a gift card. It's just a malicious SMS. But it took me a minute to think of that, you know, this was early in the morning. So I think probably that's gonna get most people. I would really like a Target gift card. You know, it's like when you get those emails from the, the fishing people trying to, and they're like, I have all this money, I'm rich and I'm dying and I live in some foreign country, just give me your bank account credentials. If you could just find the one that was legit and make all that money, it might be worth all those other times you gave up all your money. So, I mean, I can see why people fall for social engineering attacks. I really can. There's gotta be somebody who wants to give their money away, right? And then there's our favorite thing to do, particularly in the iPhone world, and that is jailbreaking. So we can jailbreak all our smartphones and get complete control of them and turn them into a microwave if we want to, but Apple doesn't like that. Sony doesn't like that either. They like it less than anybody. It really annoys me when I have to update my PlayStation in order to watch Netflix and I lose my Linux partition. That's lame. So the only way to stop this is if the companies that make these things start, start letting us use our devices the way we want to. But is that ever going to happen? Probably not. 
So, we're going to have a lot of smart people working on these operating systems and finding holes in them. Because again, it's really hard to create secure software, and it's much easier to find one problem with it, no matter how hard you try to make it secure. The problem is when our end users are jailbreaking, they're expressly giving some anonymous entity on the internet permission to exploit the device. You're basically saying, yes, you may take over my device. You're actively seeking it out. So if I Google or jailbreak my iPhone and put in the version number, I'm going to get some good ones by some good people who really just want to do good for the community, and I'm going to get some jailbreaks that are really nasty that they give you the jailbreak you want, you get root privileges, but they join you to a botnet, they steal all your data, and they have root privileges, and you've asked them to do it. So can you really even blame them? I wonder if it's even illegal if you expressly tell them to take over your device. If they harm you, you kind of deserve it, right? I can't really say yay or nay on that. So I as a smartphone, pin tester, security expert person, have a hard enough time being like, which of these jailbreaks is good? Oh, this one has source code. Oh, it's all in assembly. Good luck reading what that does. Anybody here can read assembly? Like, really, really well? Me neither. There's a couple. All right. So, for most people, even those well-educated, I mean, who, how do you even know what's a good jailbreak and what's a bad one? I have no idea. And certainly my end users who are jailbreaking their devices and bringing them into the workplace don't know either. And once they've been jailbreak broken, what's going on now? We've got any myriad number of things that could be going on because it's running its root. We know they've been exploited. What was the payload? There's been a lot of research on writing good payloads. We've got some smart people writing some really nasty stuff. We probably have no idea. My iPhone is probably a part of a botnet right now, and I don't even know it. So, my question, with all that doom and gloom about smartphones, you know, I'm a pin tester by day a lot of the time, and sometimes my clients look me up on the internet, and they're like, so you're that smartphone person, huh? What can you tell me about the smartphones in my environment? And I'm like, absolutely nothing. What can your competitors tell you about the smartphones in the environment? Like, absolutely nothing. So is my environment secure if we haven't tested the smartphones? Absolutely not. I have no idea. So we've done this pen test and you got an A plus rating because I did this a year ago and I found all your vulnerabilities and you put in a great patch management system. You're using good passwords. You've even taught people not to fall for phishing attacks. You are the ultimate of secure places. But you've got a bunch of Androids running 2.1 and jailbroken iPhones running around in your environment. Are you in fact secure? Or are you in fact hacked right now? I have no idea. So that was my question. So how can I assess the threat of these smartphones in much the same way I've been assessing your, your PCs, your servers, your Cisco firewalls and whatnot. We have tools for that. We have our Metasploit, we have our social engineer toolkit, we have our Nessus for scanning, we have all sorts of tools. It's, it makes you very famous if you write a tool. So everybody's writing tools right now. So I figured I wanted to be a security rock star too, so I wrote a tool. That didn't make you laugh, really? <laughs> all right, there we go. So what's out there now for smartphones? Generally when I say, oh, I wrote the smartphone pin testing framework, I'm a rock star now. People are like, oh, you poured an in-map onto the phone. How nice for you, you're like the 12th person to do that. So there's a lot of cool tools where you can actually pin test like the network from a smartphone, which again is nice if you want to go to the beach, you don't want to get sand all over your nice laptop, then having the pin testing tools right on your phone is cool. That's not what this does. There's also live tool CDs for smartphone specific tools. So MobySec is one of them. That was another DARPA project. There's another one that recently came out, Tendoku, which is a forensics toolkit, which uh, SPF is actually in there, but it's under the forensics section, and it doesn't do forensics, so I don't know. There's also been a lot of work done in pen testing smartphone apps. This was kind of like the year of the app. Everybody was talking about those malicious apps, even though Droid Dream came out in, what, 2010 or something? So we've known there's malicious apps, but now people are doing stuff about it. 
And one of the, I think, probably the best tool I've seen for pen testing the smartphone app. So if your client writes an app, they say, is this app secure? Much the same way we pen test our web apps. We need to look for the same sorts of flaws in our apps themselves on the devices. A good tool for that is Mercury. But for pen testing the actual devices, so you say you have 3,000 smartphones from Android 2.1 all the way to Jelly Bean, you have some Blackberries, you have some iPhones. Pen testing them, telling you about the security posture of those devices, I was left with question, question. Nessus has a couple of uh, plugins that'll tell you this is an iOS device, and Metasploit has an exploit for the iOS, like one for a browser exploit. So if you're running iOS one, you have bigger problems. So this, I feel like this is insufficient for the amount of hands that came up when I asked who has smartphones in the workplace. We need to be able to do better here. All right, so that brings us to the smartphone pen test framework, my awesome little rockstar tool. So this makes it look a lot more complicated than it is. We can run this all in one place. But basically we have our main server, which in my case is gonna be my laptop, and it allows me to work with my friends, so I can have one server and my whole pen test team could all attach to it via the web client on their laptops. What I think is the coolest thing about SVF, and I wrote it so I should know what's the coolest thing, is that I actually hook up to the modem in my smartphone. So that's my pen tester control smartphones. So a lot of our attacks Again, smartphones are going to be via the mobile modem. Mobile modem is cool, modem, mobile modem is unique, so we want to assess our users and the device itself via mobile modem. So things like phone calls, SMSs, WAP pushes, whatnot. In order to do that, we have to have a mobile modem. Most of the tools I see that allow you to use a mobile modem in any way, like for instance to let you send SMSs, make you go out to a gateway on the internet, which is usually paid. Why shouldn't people get paid, you know, 10 cents a message for their hard work? But I'm already paying all this money and in international data fees for that matter to, for my smartphone. Why should I have to pay someone else again to use the device, or to use the functionality rather? So what SPF actually does, is either via a smartphone, via an app, or through a USB modem attached to your computer, will let you use basically the device you already have, the SIM card you already have. So I have unlimited text messages. So I can text message my customers all day long via SPF, and it will take care of all that for me, and I don't have to pay the <laughs> gateway. So we'll be after our, our red phones via the server or via the smartphone, so we can go via the network or via the mobile modem as we choose based on the kind of attack we're going to run. Probably the best way to use the framework, I think, is the framework console. So I think it looks a lot like the social engineer toolkit. I can't imagine why, maybe because it's, I use it a lot and so I kind of made the same kind of menu-based thing. Don't worry, we'll look at it demoing, that's just a picture. We also have the framework GUI, which I am not at all a GUI developer. When you look at the smartphone pen test framework, Android app, you'll see how generally terrible the user interaction is. So you will be glad to know that I did not write this. My mother did. She's a much better programmer than I am. So this is probably the most robust part of the entire framework is our nice blue screen here. But I wrote all the back end stuff. She just made it pretty. So thanks to mom. You're probably asleep right now, but if you're watching the live stream, thanks mom. She usually watches, but back in America it's pretty late. But I don't know, she stays up pretty late coding, so she might be watching right now. So there's another picture. We can do all the same functionality. It's just nice little boxes. It makes it a little bit nicer to use. She always complains that I never really show much of the GUI and the demos, because all you see when you use the GUI is, oh, I type some stuff in, and I hit a button, and now suddenly everything works. Whereas with the console, we see everything that's printed out. So it's not that the GUI's bad. The GUI is probably the best part, again. But for demo sake, it's, I think, a lot more interesting where you like see things printed out to the screen rather than things magically working. And we also have the smartphone app. So this is what allows us to use the mobile modem. So it attaches to the mobile modem and then can send commands via the mobile modem in the background until we detach it, so it basically can take over your device, so you can use it well. But we can also run some of the functionality of SPF, not all of it, but some of it. For instance, you can't 
detach the mobile modem or, or clear the database. The things that don't make sense to be done from an auxiliary device, you can't do. But sending commands and running attacks, we can do it actually from the device as well. So that's kind of nice again if you want to go to the beach. So I can, be, I can leave SPF itself on some EC2 server and then just attach to it from my phone and you know, be sitting in their front office pin testing them as we go. So, fun stuff. So, bad user interaction there. That's, that's really dreadful and you'll hate using it and you'll want to help make it better. So what can we test for? We can test for remote vulnerabilities, which much like we find in the PC world, remote vulnerabilities don't happen quite as often as they used to. The days of MS-0867 may be over, except most of my clients still haven't patched for it. So. We do have some remote vulnerabilities in there. For instance, the user header data attack that about an exorbitant amount of press uh, like three weeks ago, or was all over the news. Oh, you can spoof SMS sending numbers on iPhone, as if we didn't already know this. But that attack is in there. Well, it's coming out in the newest version on Saturday at DerbyCon, so we can send iPhone messages from, say, your best friend. So if you're not going to click on my SMS message that says, hey, these are pics from last night, if it was from, say, Chris John Riley over there and he was saying that he had pics from last night, you know you would click on it. So I can change who it came from. <laughs> so we have a couple other remote vulnerabilities. Like we, if they jailbreak their iPhone and they leave the default password <coughs> on there, which of course was probably the first smartphone botnet there ever was long before me or in my SMS bots or before I even had thought of smartphone botnets. There was the iKey botnet where one phone was attacking another phone that had the default SSH password. So how many of your users are vulnerable to that? I'm not going to show that one because for some reason my iPhone went onto a separate network so I can't actually access it from SPF right now. What's with that? That's you guys' chance to exploit my phone. But my phone's jailbroken with a default password. So if you can find it, it's somewhere on the network. So it seems to be on a separate segment. I can't get to it. You can log into it and destroy it. So that's the contest. The best part is what you do to my phone. At the Hope Conference, they just wiped it out. At Black Hat, they took it one step further. The device appeared to be fine. I just suddenly started getting a lot of text messages about what Justin Bieber was up to. So if you're interested in Justin Bieber and his life and love and talents, then I know a lot about that thanks to my Black Hat users who signed me up for his text messaging updates. So if you can beat that, you'll get to be in my next talk. There's also some client-side vulnerabilities. We see a lot more things from the client-side standpoint with our smartphones. Can we get, a, get them to open a page and pop their browser? This USSD thing is technically a client-side. We do pull up a page in the browser and then exploit them and wipe their device or otherwise mess with it. So we have some of those in there. We set up a server, send them an SMS or otherwise get them to go to our page and then hopefully end up with a shell or otherwise attack them. We also do social engineering, so I make it possible that you can send out a bunch of malicious text messages and say, this is a cool app, these are pictures from last night, whatever you want it to say. And we can see if our users will click on them. They will, don't worry. You may think, oh, my users would never do that. They will. Just take my word on it. And then once we're on the device, either via just downloading an app, it really doesn't get any easier than, hey, download this app. Okay, you downloaded, now we're in, and now we can control your device. Or if we get a shell through something like a browser attack, we can look for local vulnerabilities now that we're there. Every jailbreak that's ever happened on any phone has some sort of kernel vulnerability in it that we can now test for. So I'm on your device as an app, why don't I just become rude on your device and just forget about any silly permission models that ever stopped anybody? So there's a local vulnerability for basically every smartphone device out there, every version of Android and every version of iPhone. Again, iOS 6 is already gone because it just came out. So bloodbath at its finest. So we in SPF can test for those things so I can get root on your device. So some examples, our jailbroken iPhone one here. So it also, on top of letting you test for the default, lets you test for a word list. So if they did change their password from Alpine, then they probably changed it to something really silly and simple. I know I did, you know, it always has an ex-boyfriend's name. I never bothered to change it after we break up. 
because it's really hard to type on that thing, right? A really strong password, that would be really hard. So I just put in something silly and probably all your users do too. So we can give it a word list and it will try and log into your device. And after that, once it's root on your device, again, what can be easier than just logging into it? Then we can dump a, a uh, app on there that runs as root and now has complete control of the device. So now we can ro remotely control your device via SMS, so we don't even need data connectivity to it. So via hidden SMS, very much the same thing I did with the botnet stuff a couple years ago. So it's actually some of the exact same code. And then I can remotely control your device and you have no idea what I did. You might say, well, even if they do have these, these jailbroken iPhones with root passwords being Alpine, they have to be connected to the network in order for somebody to see it, and nobody in my workplace is trying to hack into iPhones. We don't do that here. We don't employ people like that. But on their way home from work, they stop at Starbucks or other coffee shop, and they get on the network to check their email, and somebody there might be trying to find jailbroken iPhones. So then when it comes back to work the next day, it's exploited and now it's on the network. You have an exploited device in your internal network. Great, exactly what I wanted on a Monday morning. But on the flip side, we won't ever know it's there, so we won't have anything to worry about. It'll just go on for months and months stealing our data with no one noticing. So, we also have client side. So an example of that, we'll, we'll actually look at one um, where we're gonna do one of the Android WebKit vulnerabilities. It seems like over and over and over again, WebKit just becomes vulnerable to things and we find exploits for it. So lots of things there. If I can make you open up a page in your browser on your phone, then perhaps I can exploit that browser. Same thing we've been doing with Java, IE, and everything else lately. So are the smartphone browsers in your organization vulnerable to browser exploits, I asked you? Can anybody answer that question? Can anybody tell me yes or no? Do you know the exact mobile browser versions on all of your devices? Do you even know the exact browser number version thing on your own smartphone device? Anybody? All right, fair enough. <laughs> I don't either, honestly. <coughs> And then our social engineering. This gets them every time. I think SMS is the new email. So if I send you something that looks a lot like a spam message, even your free email solutions like Gmail are going to potentially get it into spam. Sometimes I go look at spam if I want to laugh, you know, hear about all the people trying to give me their money, trying to find that one that's really true. I can give you the answer. It's the one that's spelled the worst. It's the one that actually does want to give away their money. Because, you know, you make lots and lots of money by not being educated at all. So, that's the one that's true. But that's a side note. But if I send an SMS and it says exactly what that big Target one that was going around that said, you want a Target gift card, go to this link, there's no filtering for that. Some of your mobile security apps will let you filter based on phone number, so I can say this person spams, well, especially with the iPhone where I can change it through user header data, I can get around that entirely. So I just change my number, and then I can just start spamming you again. So I think SMS is the new email for spamming and phishing. I think it's going to blow up in the worst way imaginable. You're gonna start getting so many of those messages, not even gonna know what to do with yourself. And our users, not really having any education about this, are just gonna go, oh, Target gift card, oh, free car, and just keep clicking on them. Why not? So, will the users in your environment click on them? I'll go ahead and answer that for you. Yes, they will. But in our pen tests, as pen testers, we can actually show people, these are all the people that gave me their credentials through an SMS, and actually get people to care about this. And then for example, for our local vulnerabilities, so once I'm actually on the device, for instance, I could run something like exploit, or rage against the cage, or jailbreak me 3.0 on our iPhones. I can just run it locally, I'm already on the device, I can load the code, if I don't already have it, I can pull out and get it. So I can even have agents that update themselves, so when new exploit code comes out, all our agents that are already on the devices start pulling it down. So typical botnet stuff, really that's all the agents are, is a, a botnet for good that you can use in your pen test, so. Are the smartphones in your environment vulnerable to local privilege escalations? This is one you can answer. Yes, they are. So, 
We know that this is true, but let's show that CEO that I got root on their phone and stole everything from them. And then from our post-exploitation standpoint, we're either going to get a command shell or we're going to drop an app onto their phone. If we can get root, we can just drop the app as root and then it doesn't even run in user space. Or if we manage to just get them to download it, we can have an app in user space. We can package it with something normal. This is exactly what Droid Dream did and every other Android malicious app. They look normal, they run malicious code in the background, then they get root, and they take over your phone. We do the same thing here. If the bad guys are doing it, we should be testing for it, right? That's how security works. But that's not how security works for smartphones right now. Bad guys are doing it, and we're not testing for it. So with SPF, we can test for it. We can also test for, I'm on your device, what information can I pull from you? You know, typical post-exploitation for a pen test. So I'm on your device, now I can see all your source code. I'm on your smartphone, now I can see all your emails. And we can also remotely control the device, like I have it take a picture, so I can have it take a picture of you. Um, somebody requested that I take a sound recording, so that'll be a new one. I'm working on GPS right now. It's pulling the GPS credentials, but I haven't turned it into Google Maps yet, but it's going to plot the last place the device was on Google Maps so you can see exactly where people are. So, really nasty stuff. But this, again, the same sort of nasty stuff that malicious attackers are doing. So, you know, I'm not a really good coder, and if I can do this, then, you know, the the level of the competence required to be a smartphone hacker isn't really that high, so we should be worried. All right, let's do some demos, shall we? Enough talk, silly slides. So I, I didn't use slides in my class this week, and everybody complained that why are there no slides? So I guess slides have their use, I just don't know what it is. So I have some emulators here, and I have SPF here. It's actually in Backtrack 5R3 by default now, but it's the earliest version. Backtrack 5R3 came out at about the same time SPF did. So I start up SPF, I'm here in the console, and I have my nice menu. First thing I'm going to do is clear my database. Every time I demo this, I run a lot of nasty exploits, and I just want to be able to see what happened in this demo. So I clear out my database. SPF works with either MySQL or PostgreSQL, so whichever one you want to install, you just give it a config option and it will use either of those as you like. So I'm not going to do the remote attack because my iPhone is on a different network and I don't know why. So let's go ahead and attach a mobile modem. So I'm going to attach to the Smart Home Pit Test Framework app, which is on this guy. And all of the apps, so the agent, which is our malicious app that we give to our customers, or we exploit them with, that, and the smartphone pen test framework app, which is controlled by us, they both run on, on a, well, the Android versions run on any Android version of Android 1.6 or later, so G1 and later, this will work for everybody. I'm going to go ahead and attach this. What's my IP address? Always a good thing to know. Oh, now you guys can start attacking this guy too. So 10.4.1.222, that's the guy you want to kill in the talk. So zoom in so you guys can see it. All right, so I want to attach to a smartphone based app, or I can also search for an attached USB modem, but I currently don't have any on here, but I will show that at DerbyCon. So if anybody's like me running across back to America to go to DerbyCon this weekend, you can see it there. I'm just gonna give it the phone number of the mobile modem and I gave it too many fives, which is what I did at Black Hat and made it break. I wanna give it a control key, so basically if someone knows that SPF is in the environment, they can't just take over SPF. The last thing we want is to be pen testing someone and then malicious things start happening because somebody took over our framework. Key key one is a terrible key, but it's easy to type, so use a better one. And URL path, so where do I want it to check in on my web server? Brucon is a good one, I think. I may have already used Brucon, and then it'll complain. No, I didn't. Okay, so now it's waiting for the app to check in. So they're basically just going to do a handshake with each other. What did I say my IP was? 10.4.1? No user interaction here, huh? You guys don't, won't tell me? You know you know what it is. And then I give it the, see, terrible user interaction here. Somebody should really rewrite this who knows how to write nice, user-friendly apps. So I give it the same information, where to check in, 
and give it the key, and then they're going to attach with each other, and it'll allow me to use this mobile modem for attacks. Key, key, one. Why Mac decided to break this, I don't know. And then I click attach, and now my server and my phone are attached to each other, so now I'm able to use this mobile modem for my attacks. I don't have to buy any paid services. Yay, win. Okay, so let's run some social engineering client-side attacks. So number six, so you'll see the USSD things are in here, so let's do that. My emulators are not vulnerable to the wipe, but they are vulnerable to the check you're seeing on the internet where it pulls up the IMEI number. So I have both of them in here, a safe check and a malicious check. Don't use the malicious one on your pin test without permission, of course, because if you find a vulnerable phone, you may wipe their phone. It actually goes a step further. My S3, before I applied the patch the first time, it opened up the, the code to wipe the phone in the dialer, so then the user had to click send, which they may not. They might hit the back button, in which case they go back to the browser, right? Because that's the last place you were. But then there was this weird caveat to the first patch that that the second time you did it, it didn't pull it up in the dialer, it just wiped it. So I had the page automatically refresh, so it sent it to you again. So when the user hit back, it would wipe them anyways. So this may work on more phones than some of the uh, other demos you've seen. So I have that in there where it refreshes. So if it, for some reason, like my phone did, it, it works the second time, this tries that. So I'm just gonna do the safe check so it'll work against my emulator. I'm going to say number three, it asks me where on my web server I would like to host this. Rucon 2 works for me. What would I like to call it? Rucon HTML works. And who would I like to send this to? What phone number would I like to attack? So I will attack my poor little victim emulator who just gets attacked over and over and over day after day as its whole function. So it sets up that web page for me and it tells my attached mobile modem that it wants me to send a message. So from 5554, which is my jelly beans guy that is that has the app, it sent a text message to 5558. It says this is a cool page. And if I open up this page in my mobile browser, because I'm a curious sort. My emulator doesn't have an IMEI, but this is a safe check that people are using on the internet to see whether or not you're vulnerable. So my IMEI, so my personal identification number is a bunch of zeros, but if you go out to the internet and try any of the checks that people are checking with, uh, you'll see something like this with your real IMEI if you're vulnerable. So if your customers have seen this in the news, they'd be like, are we vulnerable to that? We can test for that using SPF. We don't have to create any web pages, write any code or anything. You just deploy SPF and you can send this to everybody and one, see if they'll click on this stuff. So you're really testing two things and if they're vulnerable. So I think it's cool. All right, so let's try another one. Let's get a shell. So I'm gonna do a client side shell. And again, I'm gonna send them an SMS message, but this time it's gonna pop their vulnerable browser. Again, this is my poor little victim phone I'm going to attack. So I'm going to attack it with this WebKit vulnerability for Android. Again, where do I want to put it on my server? What do I want to call it? And who do I want to attack? And now it's going to wait for the shell. I have a config file option where I can put this in the background, but since we're doing a nice demo here, we can see what's happening. Uh, we have to wait for our actual SMS to come in. I don't have them check in. You can change how often they check in, but I don't have them check in like every second. That might start running down battery and we don't like that. So there we go. So this is a cool page. Again, it came from 5554. And if I go to this link, then it's going to try and open that page in my browser, which if you've done any browser exploitation, it's spraying the heap into a disastrous mess and destroying it, so this browser is going to have no way of recovery and eventually it's just going to die. And while that goes on, and this is just all like exploit code that was publicly available that I ported in, so nothing really exciting there, just the ability to use it. Um, so while that's running, so you have to see it about to crash in the background, we also have our nice GUI here. We can do all the same things. Yeah, there it goes. So my browser died. 
I'm a user of Android, that does not surprise me. I've seen things die before, I am not. So surprised, I'm not, certainly not going to say, oh, I was just a tag. It's just like, oh, my Android ran out of memory, oops, so it got killed. Viking killer killed it. So what it did was it threw me a shell. Uh, just for the demo, I have it run one um, command. Basically, it says, who am I? And we see that we're at number two, which is the browser, and then it dumps the shell into the background. So user interaction with the shell also possible. Um, let's see. Let's attach to an agent. So all of this nonsense is going away. Um, this is the first thing I did. So I don't think I really knew what I was doing. So I'm gonna have agents actually check in and tell me information about them so I don't have to type all this silly stuff in. So I have an agent deployed in here on one of my other emulators. So I'm gonna attach SPF to it. And then I can actually send commands to that agent. So if somebody I have popped, I can now control them. So the things that are in here now, I can make them send an SMS, which I don't know why you want to do that on a pen test, but I had the code already for my botnet, so why not? Make it take a picture, grab their contacts, get their SMS database, or do privilege escalation, try and get root on them with a local privilege vulnerability. So let's do take a picture. And this can all communicate via HTTP or SMS. So as long as I have a web server or can connect to them via SMS, so their phone number is within service, I can do this to them. So again, out of band communication. You're looking at all the traffic coming out of those devices via the network. Well, I'm going through SMS. Good luck seeing me. The user certainly isn't going to. Uh, I already showed SMS stuff. Let's do HTTP just to see it. And so it creates that command, puts it up on the web server, and then my exploited phone is going to come back in when it next polls, take that picture, and then upload it to me. So this is a simulator, so we'll see a picture of an Android, but we could see whatever they see, as long as they have a camera. And let's see, so we have, see how to turn it take a picture, because I have sound on. Um, so here on the, the user interface graphical thing again, we can do all the same things. I think the only thing that makes it vastly superior is that the view of the database is much better. See, our picture came back, so I can open this file and it's a picture of an Android with a talking bubble. And it also keeps track of all the exploits we've run and whether they were successful. For instance, our client-side attack, I ran it against 5558. I did the WebKit exploit, and yes, it was vulnerable, and if we'd done the remote attack against the iPhone, we'd see that the IP address and what worked, and we would have, yes, dumped an agent. So we can do all sorts of things here. We can also run some commands straight here from our framework app. So for instance, if I want to control my agents, I can select my agents. Here's the only one that's attached. And then I can send it commands from here. Again, lovely user interaction we have going on here. So for instance, I can send an SMS. Who do I want to send an SMS to? So I'll again send it to that victim who just gets attacked all the time and I'll have it say hi. And all my demos have worked so far, so this one is going to have to fall on its face even though it's really simple. Oh, sure enough it didn't, but what you notice is that though I sent this from the framework Android app, which is on, on 5554, if I come over to my guy and send the message to, this isn't in 5554, it's from 5556, which is our one running the app, so, or running the agent rather. So our exploited device sent this message. All right, I have 10 minutes, which is good because I'm done with demos and I'm going to take some questions, but let me show you the last couple, like cleaning up things, housekeeping slides. So mitigation strategies for this. I get questions, what can we do to stop this? So theoretically, antivirus should see, especially when I'm doing local privilege escalation, and you know, I'm not that smart. I just pasted in people's public exploit code straight off the internet. The same thing Droid Dream did, mind you. They stole it from the 4 room. 
So antivirus should be seeing this theoretically. None of the antivirus I've looked at have. And even if they did, I could do things like obfuscate it or have it pull it down later after antivirus has checked it. But as of right now, antivirus is not seeing my agents. There's nothing really to stop it from updating to see exactly what my agent does. But we could build custom agents, and I really don't, I don't think mobile antivirus is ready to do as well as PC antivirus is doing and catching Meterpreter these days. I think we're a ways off. We've also got things like MDM solutions. So are your MDM solutions stopping this? Nothing that I've looked at has. I was giving a talk on Android permissions and somebody raised their hand and said, you know, they say we can't jailbreak our devices and have them on the network, but then I got past our MDM solution by changing bin SU for super user to bin SU1 and it didn't see it anymore. So like mobile antivirus, I don't think MDM is yet up to the task. If you have an MDM, or mobile device management, rather, I shouldn't use acronyms. They tell you not to do that in talks. But if you have one that you think can stand up to this, I would love to see it, I really would. I think there's a lot to be done in the mobile device management area and the antivirus area. I'm actually working on a defensive side now, so hopefully the next time you see me, I'll be talking about defensive things and actually stopping my own toolkit. And then our other option is can we take the smartphones out of the workplace? And there's no way that's going to happen because if I can't check my email when I'm in the beach, there's going to be a problem. So future of the project, more modules in each category. This just came out in August, so porting in every vulnerability. Like just since this has come out, we've had that big user header data thing. iOS 6 got jailbroken, and this USSD thing that I showed you, all in like the span of a month. A lot of people are working in mobile. So there's a lot of old stuff to port back in that still works, since nobody updates their devices. Or in the case of Android, you're not even allowed to because they won't update you past like Android 2.2 if your phone is more than a year old. So getting more modules in, more post-exploitation options like the GPS, taking a recording. So there's many things you can do with these devices. I want to be able to do all of them straight from SPF. And I want to integrate with other tools. I'm trying to integrate with the Pwn plug at DerbyCon. We're going to try and code it sitting at the booth. So actually in the Pwn plug, I'll have all of SPF, including the modem, just be in the little device. Hook up with things like Metasploit and Social Engineer Toolkit. Doing some stuff with uh, Aircrack as well. Some people realize that most of your phones, I think everything is at the Windows phone, if it, for instance, if we're attached to the Brucon network, and I put up a Brucon network here and I'm closer, you guys will attach to me, which is not a new exploit, but apparently your phones still do this. And I really want to see some community-driven things. So if you like this, if you thought, uh huh, this would be really awesome if it did this, I'd love to hear from you. And if you're a coder and want to be involved, I'd love to hear from you as well. So just me coding this and now a couple other people is not that great, particularly since I'm such a bad coder. People laugh at my code a lot. So if you would like to be involved or just have ideas for it, Please do get in contact with me. I want this to become the next Metasploit, so I need all of you to be involved. I need SPF fanboys and girls. And I also want more reporting capabilities, better than just that nice interface, because I don't like writing reports, and I think tools that write reports for you are awesome. So this is me, and now I'll take some questions. Any questions, anyone? I don't know Stick your hand up. Did I bore you guys all so much you don't have anything to say to me? Coming, Chris. I should be scared. I can see it coming. Here comes the troll. <laughs> I'm not even going to laugh. It's really dumb. Um, how modular is it? Is it easy for people to write modules, or are they going to have to write, actually edit the framework itself to actually get new modules in? So the question is, how modular is it? Like, if you wanted to contribute something, how hard would it be? I would like to make it more modular. It's pretty modular now. You wouldn't have to change any of the existing code. You just paste your code into it and then like call send SMS or call make file. Or... So there would be a, a certain amount of learning curve, but I write codes as if there's nothing but primitives, so it's pretty easy to read what I'm doing. But I would like to see it become entirely modular, like with Metasploit, right, where you don't really have to know anything about what's going on. You just call connect and send. And... So I'd like to see it become more like that, but I don't think there's much of a learning curve right now, but send me some modules and we'll find out. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, um, the question is, 
Uh, is it scriptable? I mean, uh, am I able to uh, write scripts and attack <coughs> multiple mobile phones uh, at once? So the question is, is it scriptable? So can we, for instance, just give it a script and it will attack and say do these attacks against these phones? Right now it's not. That's like the next feature request, like in the next set. It didn't even occur to me. And like the first time I went to it, we were like, I don't want to type one, two, three. So yes, that's definitely coming. I'll just be away. I can give it a script and it'll do everything I want. But that's not in there yet. But look out for that. I update SPF about every two weeks. I try to. So. There's new stuff coming out each time, so if you have any other ideas for things, definitely send them to me or come talk to me, and I'll try and get everybody's ideas in there, like Google Voice is coming in as a modem next, um, lots of cool stuff. So this USSC thing that just came out like two days ago is already in there, so try and keep up with what users want. So. Any other questions? All right, thank you, BrewCon. This is my first BrewCon. I'm really excited. George will be around for the rest of the day. Yep. So if you've got questions, buy drinks, ask questions. Yes, drinks are good. I like them. So, Andres is up next with um, Remote Access Tools, uh, Stories from the Trenches, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Stick around. Um, after that is lunch, free lunch. I'm not going to sing the Lumberjack song. You should sing it. <laughs> No.